Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Senate Bill 1602 Helicopter Pesticide Training. My name is Josh Bernard, Interim Division Chief for Private Forests. Today, we'll provide an overview of Senate Bill 1602 by showing an introduction video and a video that focuses on helicopter pesticide application buffers. Uh, following that, um, we'll cover how to uh, register to receive communications on nearby helicopter pesticide applications and how to notify uh, for operations for helicopter pesticide applications. We'll also cover enforcement and review of water uses qualifying for a spray buffer and who to contact. If you have questions, please hold them till the end of each section. We'll have time for questions at the end of each section. Uh, for pesticide applicator continuing education credits, enter your name, ODA, and license number in the chat. For Society of American Forester Certified Forester Continuing Education Credits, please enter your name and SAF in the chat. Please do this again at the break and the end of the training today. All right, now let's um, move to an overview of Senate Bill 1602. Hello, I'm Kyle Abraham. My team and I administer the Oregon Forest Practices Act and rules. These laws are developed by either the state legislature or Oregon Board of Forestry, sometimes both. Today we are reviewing some of these laws. The department's approach to administering the laws is to help people know the laws and do the right thing up front. We use a multi-tiered approach, engineer, educate, and enforce. Using science and engineering to develop the laws is ideal for forest management. Once a law is in place, our team educates staff, the regulated community, and the public for high compliance rates. Then, if needed, we can enforce the laws with the appropriate penalties. Most people prefer compliance without enforcement. In June 2020, the Oregon Legislature passed Senate Bill 1602 and the governor signed it into law. Both conservation and timber industry groups supported the bill. These groups will continue to discuss, develop, and recommend changes to the Oregon Forest Practices Act. The department supports this approach. The diverse views and productive discussions can help improve forestry laws while addressing concerns for responsibly managing forests. The department and board look forward to receiving the recommendations. Parts of the law go into effect at different times. The law changes some of Oregon's non-federal forest land protections. For instance, the law increases buffers around homes, schools, water intakes, and some streams for helicopters spraying pesticides. This part of the law starts on January 1st, 2021. The buffers are at least 75 feet from streams with fish or domestic use, 50 feet from other streams with surface water present, 300 feet from a school or inhabited dwelling, and 300 feet from a qualifying water intake. The law includes the Siskiyou region in the rules for protecting salmon, steelhead, and bull trout streams. This part of the law starts on January 1st, 2021. The agency must develop its e-notification system to improve communication among helicopter pesticide sprayers, neighbors, and water users. The law provides funds for developing the system it will likely take about a year to complete this work. The communications from a helicopter pesticide applicator to the department and qualifying registrants must include four parts. First, a proposed spray, which includes the location, pesticides likely to be used, a 90-day window for applying those pesticides, and the notifier's email, address, and phone number. Second, the 90-day time available to spray. Third, the notice by 7 p.m. the night before the planned spray, which we call the pending spray. Fourth, the spray is either complete or incomplete. The applicators must also notify water users and neighbors before spraying. Qualifying water users and neighbors must be notified about the spray timing. They will receive the first message when there is a proposed spray. Now let's take a look at who qualifies and how to receive these messages. 
Neighbors and water users must sign up to receive these notices. The neighbors and water users who can sign up are those within one mile of the proposed spray. They will receive notices by email or text message about the proposed 90-day window and the night before the flights. This part of the law will start between July 2021 and June 2022. Next, let's turn to the penalties. Of course, it's better for everyone and the protected natural resources if there aren't violations. However, if people do violate these laws, there are fines for failing to submit spray plans and notifying the department and neighbors. There are also fines for people who interfere with the spray applications. Please know that the laws did not change for pesticides sprayed by ground, fixed wing, or the use of drones. The final part of Senate Bill 1602 is an opportunity for further discussion about how to improve Oregon's Forest Practices Act. In the coming months, the governor's office will mediate talks among the conservation and timber industry groups. The groups jointly will develop and recommend changes to forestry laws, and this work should be done by late 2022. Thank you for your interest in these forestry laws and hope you continue to enjoy Oregon's forests. Hello, I'm Mike Odenthal with the Oregon Department of Agriculture. The Oregon Department of Agriculture is responsible for administering the Oregon Pesticide Control Act. This law, along with federal pesticide law, regulates all pesticide use, distribution, and formulation. And remember, pesticides include fungicides, insecticides, rodenticides, herbicides, and antimicrobials. This comprehensive group of laws regulates all pesticide use, including home and garden, farm and forest, and all the other uses. The labels on the pesticide containers explain how to use those products. Remember, the label is the law. People who follow the label instructions are following state and federal laws. The state of Oregon does have additional laws for proper use. The state licenses and offers annual training for professional pesticide applicators and training materials like this video. The goal is to help pesticide users understand the laws so they can use these products safely and responsibly. Pesticides are used every day all around us. People apply pesticide products using spray bottles, backpack sprayers, and sometimes aircraft. Forest managers will sometimes use pesticides to control weeds so their seedlings may flourish and grow into strong, healthy forests. Today we're discussing rules for helicopter pesticide spray applications. These are typically done in recently harvested areas with newly planted trees. The Oregon Department of Agriculture works with the Oregon Department of Forestry to regulate this pesticide use and to protect our natural resources. Hello, I'm Jennifer Ward with the Oregon Department of Forestry. My job is to administer Oregon's Forest Practices Act, which is intended to protect natural resources and provide for responsible logging and forest management. The forestry laws require landowners to successfully plant new forests after a harvest. Some landowners use helicopters to apply pesticides to control weeds so the trees can grow. As of January 1st, 2021, the forestry laws include new buffers around schools and streams. These laws apply to helicopter pesticide use, not fertilizer use. Helicopter pesticide applicators must not directly apply herbicides or other pesticides within 300 feet of a school's campus or an inhabited dwelling, like a home. School here means Head Start, private or public school for any K-12 program, college or university, Oregon School for the Deaf, Oregon Youth Authority Residential Academies, and Educational Service Districts. Within the greater of 75 feet, or the full width of the Riparian Management Area, or RMA, of a F or D stream, 
within 50 feet of a type end stream where the surface water is present. The spray buffers are horizontal distances. Riparian management areas are measured in slope distances. Bottom line, the buffer distance is whichever is further from the water. Before spraying any pesticides, a notification of operations must be submitted to the Oregon Department of Forestry. The notification must include a map showing water resources. Now, let's take a closer look at each buffer requirement. First, let's look at a school adjacent to a newly planted forest. When treating the area, the pilot must leave a 300 foot buffer between the school's campus and the spray area. For inhabited dwellings like homes and for qualifying water intake points, the pilot must also leave a 300 foot buffer. Qualifying water intake points are those recorded in the Oregon Department of Forestry's e-notification system. Forestry works closely with the Oregon Water Resources Department and the public to update the qualifying water intake points. Now let's take a look at the other ways the laws protect water quality. These laws require buffers along streams. There are two stream buffer distances. The setback distance from type F or fish bearing and type D or domestic use streams must be the greater distance of either 75 feet or the required vegetated buffer. The required vegetated buffer is sometimes called the riparian management area or RMA. An RMA is an area along streams and other bodies of water where trees and shrubs must be retained and special management practices are required to protect water quality and fish and wildlife habitat. The second stream buffer distance is for type N streams, which do not have fish or domestic use. The pilot must determine if surface water is present before the application. If surface water is present, pesticides may not be applied within 50 feet of the high water line of the type N stream. The 50 foot buffer is required. The last part of this law addresses interference with and memorializing the work. The law prohibits interference with these pesticide applications. If a person interferes with one of these operations, they can be fined up to $5,000. The law also allows for a person to video or photograph a helicopter application from a place where they have the right to be present, as long as it does not interfere. If you have any questions, please contact your local stewardship forester. Thank you for your interest in the Oregon Forest Practices Act. Hello, my name is Ted and I am with the Pesticide Analytical and Response Center. Did you know that no other state coordinates pesticide investigations like Oregon? The Pesticide Analytical and Response Center, or PARC, coordinates pesticide investigations with many different state agencies, including the Oregon Occupational Safety and Health Administration, the Oregon Department of Agriculture, and the Oregon Department of Forestry. If citizens have concerns that pesticide use has negatively impacted people, animals, or the environment, they may report these concerns 24 hours a day by dialing 211. Specialists at 211 Info will take your information and forward that information to PARC. And a PARC member agency will follow up with you within one business day. Thank you for your time. I'm the operations and policy analyst with um, working with ODF, and I'll be the one processing the registrations that come through the e-notification system. And registrations can begin starting on December 1st. Today, I'll be covering a few new processes within the e-notification system, the differences between registrants and subscribers. And then we'll watch a training, a training video on how to register that will be available on ODF's external website for um, interested parties to view on how to register. So a few new processes um, within the e-notification system. Um, for notifiers, there will be a new separate process for submitting helicopter pesticide notifications. Um, notifiers will follow a completely new workflow from the standard notifications. 
And Joe will cover this more in his presentation up next. Next, we have registrants. Um, the public and interested parties can register their home or qualifying surface water intake within the e-notification system to receive com those communications about planned helicopter pesticide applications within one mile of their home. Next, uh, we have um, communications. So the e-notification has been designed to send out automated communications about nearby pesticide applications to registrants by email, text message, or both. Um, next, we'll review the differences um, between a registrant and a subscriber. Registrants can only receive information well, they, I'm sorry. So registrants will only receive um, information and communications on helicopter pesticide applications. Um, they can only register their location, the location of their home or the location of their surface water intake. Um, registrants will not receive notification details until after 14 days after the notification has been submitted. And the registrant will receive communications by email or text message by 7 p.m. the day before an operation begins. And for subscribers, um, subscribers can notify and subscribe to all notification types. Um, subscribers can subscribe to an area and they will receive the notification details immediately after the notification is submitted. There is not that uh, 14 day delay as there are with um, registrants. Um, and then lastly, they will not receive um, those next day communications about um, helicopter pesticide applications. Okay. And up next, we'll watch a uh, the training video on how potential registrants will register within the e-notification system. To register within the e-notification system, you must first create an account. Scroll to the bottom of the home page and, and click create account. Next, you will fill in your name and email address. Then choose a password. This next section requires that you enter your mailing address and phone number. If you are a landowner or timber owner, you would fill in this bottom section. Next click create account. The system will send you an email with a link to activate your account. Click the link and sign in. To start a new registration, click on registration and then on register. If registering a residence, click on I have a qualifying residence. Give your registration a name, something similar to house on State Street. Next, add your physical address. And click next. On this next page, you will upload your supporting documentation, such as a valid driver's license, utility bill, rent receipt, property tax record. Click on choose file and upload the file from your computer. Select the document and click Upload. Click Next. On this page, you will select how you would like to receive communications. You can choose email, text message, or both. If choosing text message, enter the cell phone number you would like your communications to go to. Click Next. Review the information entered to make sure it is correct.
then click Submit at the top of the page. Once your registration is reviewed by the department, you will receive an email stating that the account is active or that more information is needed to process your request. Next, we will go through how to register your residence using your tax lot ID number. Again, click on registration, then on register. Click on I have a qualifying residence. Give your registration a name, something like House on State Street. Click on I do not have a physical address. Scroll down to the tax lot ID section. Select, select a county from the drop down menu. If you don't know your tax lot ID, you can use this link to ormap.net to help assist you in locating your tax lot ID number. Once that information is entered, click Next. Upload your supporting documentation, such as a valid driver's license, utility bill, rent receipt, mortgage document, or property tax record. Click on Choose File and select the document from your computer. Then click Upload. Click Next to move on to the communications page. Here you will select how you would like to receive your communications. You can choose email, text message, or both. If choosing text message, enter the cell phone number you want your communications to go to. Then click Next. Review all the information you have entered is correct. And click Submit. Once your registration is reviewed by the department, you will receive an email stating that the account is active or that we might need more information to process your request. Next, we will walk through how to register your surface water intake. From the home page, click on registration and then on register. Here you will see a list of all the water uses that qualify. Click on I have a qualifying water intake. Give your registration a name similar to water intake. Next, enter the latitude and longitude of the water intake location. If you have your water rights documentation, click the first box. Next, click the last box attesting that you control the works at the point of diversion. Click Next. Here you will choose a water right document to upload. Select the file from your computer and upload it here. On this next page, you will select how you would like to receive your communications. You can choose email, text message, or both. If choosing text messages, enter the cell phone number you want your communications to go to. Click Next. Here, review all the information you've entered is correct, and click Submit at the top of the page. Once your registration is reviewed by the department, you will receive an email that your registration is active or that we might need more information to process your request. Lastly, we will go through how to register your surface water intake if your water is exempt from water right requirements. From the home page, again, click on registrations and then on register. Here you will see a list of all the water uses that qualify. Click on I have a qualifying water intake. Give your registration a name, something like livestock watering. Enter the latitude and longitude of the location of the point of diversion.
click on I have a water use that is exempt, that is exempt from water rate requirements and qualifies for a spray buffer. In the box below, describe your spring box or water intake and what the water is used for. Next, click the box that you attest that you believe that you have a lawful entitlement to make the water use qualifying for a spray buffer. You will then click the box, I attest that I control the works at the point of diversion for the water use qualifying for a spray buffer. Click next. If you don't have any supporting documents to upload, click next. Select how you would like to receive your communications. You can choose email or text message or both. If choosing text message, enter the cell phone number you want your communications to go to. Click next. Review the information that you've entered is accurate. And then click submit. Once your registration is reviewed by the department, you will see, receive an email stating that your account is active or that we may need more information to process your request. Okay, so that concludes the training video. Um, we'll take some time now to answer any questions that anyone might have. How do I tell if I've already uh, registered previously? I no longer get notifications about uh, operations. Okay, so you the registration process won't won't begin until December first. So you must be talking about subscriptions, like you must have subscribed and um, when you're no longer receiving those. Um, that that must be what it is, and I'm not sure I understand the difference between a registrant and a subscriber. Okay, um, so the biggest difference between a registrant and a subscriber is a registrant can register their home address um, or their surface water intake location and receive communications about the pesticide applications within one mile of their home. Um, so with notific or with subscriptions, you, um, you know, you can subscribe to an area and you'll receive all sorts of, um, you know, it could be for different types of notifications. So it's more of a direct communication um, so that you would know when a operator would be spraying within one mile of your home or surface water intake. Does that help? S sort of. My problem with the subscription in the past was I would get a map that had no recognizable landmarks. It would just be a little outlined area in the middle of nowhere and I couldn't see any road names, the closest road name nearby or, or anything to tell me where it really was. So it was um, not very helpful. Yeah. But does, a subscriber, does a subscriber get all the pesticide notifications that a reg registrant does? Um, they, you can still subscribe to an area to receive um, you know, the notifications about pesticide um, operations, but you just wouldn't receive that direct contact, the text message or email. So you and could subscribe to review those notifications. Go ahead, Josh. And what I was gonna say is those are, um, to help separate that, those are two distinct and separate processes. So you can sign up for a subscription where you indicate your area of interest, which applies to, any and all operations that you're interested in. And when you do that and there is um, a notification in your area, you do get, do get an email with a link to the information on that notification. For the um, registration um, process described under Senate Bill 1602, it only applies to helicopter pesticide applications. And so it's specific to only that type of operation. Each one of those will have to be renewed on a yearly basis. So they're um, 
they're, they're good for a year. And then um, there is the need to indicate that those are still valid. Um, you will get a reminder email for that. I see there's there's a question in the chat as well, um, Joe. Maybe I don't I don't know if you can address that. Um, it says how will you protect the personal in, info you are requiring? Cybersecurity question mark. So yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, the the personal information that you log in is is um, we're not act, asking for anything other than contact information, uh, and that information is only available to either ODF or the parties on the notification that you have either subscribed to or registered for. And that's, that's the only way it's uh, available. It's on secure servers at the state data center. Uh, so they're behind firewalls and um, protected that way. Great, thanks, Jill. You, you are asking for a driver's license and possibly tr property tax documents, which are um, much more than just location. Correct. And so, yeah, that's a good point. I'm, I'm glad you, you asked that so I can clarify. Those documents are not available to anyone other than ODF, um, and they are stored on a secure server. And they will be, um, the, the policy uh, currently is that, that we destroy those documents after uh, seven, I think it's, it's a retention seven years, Josh at this it, time it'll follow that retention policy and it'll be tied to whenever that registration is no longer valid right all right so any other questions i i do see a question in the chat but we might hold that for the review of the water uses qualifying for a spray buffer. Um, it's referring to points of use and points of diversion, and we'll have a, a section dedicated to that. All right, so I guess, yeah, if there's no more questions, um, we'll go ahead and take a quick 10 minute break. And then when we get back, Jill will cover the new processes with inference for notifiers who are submitting a helicopter pesticide notification. Uh, thanks for uh, coming out today. Uh, I'm gonna cover the new notification process and the, and the changes that are in, uh, in the e-notification system. So let me start off and, and kind of uh, describe what uh, I'll be talking about today, which is the notifier changes I'll go through a demo of, um, of the system and how it is working when, in regards to the changes under Senate Bill 1602 and helicopter spray method uh, notifications. I'll talk about the mobile functionality as part of this and some next steps that are in here. So if you have any questions, type them in the chat or at the end, feel free to, uh, to go ahead and uh, ask those. So, the changes under the notification process under Senate Bill 1602 uh, uh, apply to helicopter spray method only. So any other notification type is gonna remain the same as it is today. Uh, one of the biggest things around the, the notification process under Senate Bill 1602 is that the notifications are only valid for a 90 day application window. So when you notify, you have to let, uh, you have to define what that 90 days is. And that's as, that's as only as, uh, that 90 days is, uh, is the only valid time that that notification is, uh, is uh, basically valid. Uh, uh, so you, uh, once that 90 day ends, it stops that notification, you have to re-notify. And we've added some processes in there to, to make that easy to do. Um, there is a 15 day waiting period or a 30 day waiting period depending on if there's a registrant uh, within one mile of your units or not. Uh, and those waiting periods cannot be waived. Um, we do detect whether there someone has registered either a resident or water intake within a mile of any of the units. And that does affect that 15 or 30 day waiting period. And you must update the status of, your, of the units you are planning on spraying 
and have sprayed. And this is regardless if there are registrants nearby or not, you have to update the status. So the pending status is, it must be done by 7 p.m. the day before the spray is planned. And then you must mark them as complete, meaning you've completely sprayed it and you're done. Incomplete, uh, which means you've partially sprayed a unit and plan on coming back and, and spraying it again. And that has to be done within 24 hours after the spray is complete. And then the registrant information, contact information is available after the notification has been submitted. And so it's very similar to subscriber information today. Uh, that's not available uh, until uh, after you submit a notification. So I'm gonna go ahead and get into the demo here. Get out of this and get into the website. And one of the things you'll notice uh, is that we, in working on the Senate Bill 1602 requirements, uh, one of that is that we, we needed to make um, the website mobile friendly. And in the process of doing that, we've changed the look of, of uh, some of the pages, most of the pages. And um, one of those kind of, it kind of makes them look fresher and newer. So this is what the new homepage will look like. And once you go ahead and you sign in, you get into your uh, dashboard. And the dashboard has updated in that now there are now three tabs. There's your notification tab and your subscriptions tab, which exists today. And then, uh oh, I'm wondering if it logged me out of the system. Yeah, hold on. A I waited too long and it logged me out of the system. There's the notifications, the subscriptions, and now this new tab, which is registrations. So when you have an e-notification account, you can do all three of these. You can have a notification, you can notify, you subscribe, and you can register. Under the notification tab, we've changed things a bit to, to really allow an ease of use under this, uh, the, the requirements for the Senate Bill 1602. And that is we've added this my helicopter spray status to the right here. And this lists all of the notifications that are under um, the Senate Bill 1602 requirements of uh, helicopter spray notifications and allows you to quickly kind of go in and update your spray status. It's easy, it's on the dashboard, it allows you to get in there. And your ODF messages have been moved here to the bottom. For notifications, really, and you'll have to forgive me, it's a little slow. We're on our test server. All right. The first thing you'll notice is when you go in to submit a new notification is that there is a new checkbox here. This checkbox is to notify to apply pesticides by helicopter and it's submitted separately from all over other activities. And this is Senate Bill 1602. When the statute has been defined by the state, we will add that statute uh, information here. But what you'll notice is when you click that you're notifying to apply pesticides by helicopter, it grays out the other type of uh, notification types. And that's because the requirements for the helicopters, uh, applying pesticides by helicopter under Senate Bill 62, 1602 is so unique that it doesn't apply to any other. The, when you are uh, notifying for this method, this is the only kind of a, type of notification you can notify by. Everything else um, is a different notification type. You can't combine the two. When you select that, you can also go to your map page. And one of the things uh, under Senate Bill 1602 is uh, one of the requirements is that each unit needs to be uh, notified for its own activities, its own chemicals, and then updated independently. And um, because of that, uh, the system now will, 
when you do um, a common method for um, importing is importing shapes into um, the notification system. So when you're importing it and you're using your WKT, when you import it, the system will explode those out to individual units. And they will automatically uh, label them unit one through however many. You know, it's common for us to receive notifications that have 20 different units on them. And today, those are commonly submitted as a single unit with 20 different shapes under them. Under this process, that the system will break it out into 20 individual units. And then it will automatically label those unit one to all the way to 20 using a left to right um, process, going starting at the left, going to the right, and labeling one through 20. You can edit those names. You can, you can change uh, shapes. You can do all sorts of things in here. Everything else is the same. It's just that process of importing um, multi-shape unit does explode it out to individual units. And that's because of the requirements under Senate Bill 1602. The next step after you've imported your shapes or drawn the shapes that are part of your notification is you'll go to this new window, which is your helicopter pesticide 90 day, 90 day application window. And this is where you define where that 90 days is valid. So first thing is, if there is a registrant within one mile of any of the units on the notification, there's a 30 day waiting period. If there are no registrants, there's a 15 day waiting period. And that waiting period has to occur before that 90 day valid window occurs. And what, uh, for ease of use and definition, we have you know, added this functionality here that shows you which units have a registrant within one mile. And this allows you to kind of quickly, uh, you know, if you have a 20 unit notification and there's only one unit that has a registrant nearby and you wanna operate before 30 days, you can notify separately. You can take that one unit out, notify it for it individually, and then take the other 19 units and notify them and only have a 15 day waiting period. And that was based on some of the uh, stakeholder feedback that we had. And as you can see here, the 15 day waiting period, it automatically sets the date 30 days out because there are registrants. If there are no registrants, it'll automatically set it for uh, 15 days out. That, that's done uh, automatically within the system. You can define what this 90, day, uh, 90 days is. And as you can see, the 90 days um, goes beyond the end of the year. The system doesn't allow you to, to uh, notify beyond December 31st. The next, um, next part of this process is defining what the activities are on each individual unit. And that's as defined under the bill. You have to define the activities and the chemicals under each unit. And you have to do so as accurately as possible. So this page lists all four units and you can see each one has a different um, uh, resources defined depending on what's found there. But uh, for ease of use, we've added the, this ability to add your activity here. And you can select any of the activities based on a unit. So for helicopter spray method under a unit, there's really only five things you can do. Herbicide application is the most common. You can say the start date is that 90 day window. I didn't update it, so it's pulling in this. The system will validate that date for you. And then you can define what your chemicals are. Now I'm just going to, for example, add chemical, a carrier and, a, and an additive. Don't take this as literal because I'm just doing this for speed. And I'm saving these. And it'll take you back to that activities page with everything there. Now, if you have 20 units, it's a bit cumbersome. We understand to do this for each individual unit. So we added a functionality called copy activity. And this will take 
the unit that I just defined everything and I can copy it to all units or specific units. So once I'm copy it to all of the units, you can see it copies that same information across all of the units. And that's really, we've done that for ease of use because we know the requirement uh, can be cumbersome if uh, you have 20 to 30 units that, are, that need to be defined. The next step in here are your contacts. Now, under the, the bill, it's defined that you can only have a single operator for a notification. So if you plan on having multiple operators, you will need to do a separate notification for the two different operators. So under here, we've pulled out the, the operator and the landowner contacts and made them their own contacts page rather than having it under the activities like it's currently defined. This is a bit different. You still have to have a fire emergency contact. And then the next area is a new site condition that's specific for Senate Bill 1602. And these need to be uh, filled in. They are not defaulted to anything. So these are required. Uh, it's homes and schools. So it's asking you, are you aware of any schools or school campuses within 300 feet of your application area? Or are you aware of any homes or other dwellings within 300 feet of your application area? And this is new, and this is only for helicopter spray method uh, notification types. Next are the documents. And this is the same, this has not changed. And then finally is the summary page. Now on the summary page, the first thing you'll notice is this red here, stating that these notifications cannot be continued into the next calendar year. So once that 90 day is, has uh, expired, once this is ended at the end of the year, these cannot be continued. You will need to re-notify. Now we still have the copy, capability, so you can copy it and re-notify easily, uh, but these, these cannot be continued. The other thing you'll, uh, that we've added here is a legal notice. We've updated it for neighborly communication, and this only appears on these types of notifications. It's the notifier must mark the, each unit as pending by 7 p.m. the day before spraying. In first pending units, the notifier must report that the spray is either complete or incomplete. And again, complete is you've completely sprayed it and you're, you're done. Incomplete is you've partially sprayed it, but you plan on coming back and completing that spray. If you partially spray and don't plan on coming back, you mark it as complete. Now for marking it as complete, it's within 24 hours after spraying, and for incomplete, it's by 11.59 p.m. the day after. So if I were to mark something as pending yesterday, I sprayed it as, I sprayed it this morning at 8 a.m. By 8 a.m. tomorrow on Thursday, I need to mark it as complete. Or by 11.59 p.m. tomorrow, I need to mark it by as incomplete. Now for units that don't get sprayed, you don't need to do anything. So if you mark it as pending, you get out there, conditions aren't right, you don't spray, you don't need to do anything. And the system will go ahead and reset by itself. Again, here is your 90 day application window. And like uh, something that's, uh, that we've added on this summary page is under each unit, we show, show which units have a registrant within a mile and which one do not have a registrant. We also allow you the ability to add activities here. It takes you back to the activities page and um, allows you to add that easily. So once you submit a notification, and I'm not gonna submit this, I'll show you what it looks like on the, on the page. Um, this will go out to all of the parties on the notification and you will be able to Show, see 
registrants that are on there. So one of the unique things for the registrants versus subscribers is that we include a little more detail on here for ease of contact of those registrants. You'll see that the registrant's name, the type of re uh, registration they have, water intake, home. It'll also have points of diversion on there as well. Their address, their phone number, and we have included their email address, which is unique versus subscribers. And in the feedback we got in working with the stakeholders and reviewing this, the email address was important and that allows them to quickly and easily reach out to all of their registrants rather than having to make phone calls in sequential order, which may take time. So that's why email addresses are included for registrants and not subscribers. So once that is done and you're within the 90 day window, you can go to this page, your homepage, and update your spray status. So you're within that 90 day window, you're ready to spray the next day. What you will do is select the unit and mark it as pending. And that it says it's pending a spray for tomorrow. Once you hit yes, this will go out to any registrants that are nearby. Now I selected this one, I'm assuming, I think Jennifer is a, a registrant near there. This will go to their email addresses or their um, text messages uh, to their phones. So they'll be getting those alerts right now. It's pretty immediate. One of the things I do wanna clarify on this is when a notification is submitted, the notifier sees who the registrants are right away. But the registrants do not receive this, this notification for 14 days, and that's defined within the bill. After that 14 days um, is complete, the system will look at any new registrants that are, uh, have been added to um, proximity within one mile of any of the units add those to this notification and send that notification out. It will also let the notifier know that there are new registrants between that first day of submittal and that 14th day. And it will update this list as well. Now, after that 14th day, the system will not look for any new registrants. It cuts it off and that's how it's defined in the bill. And so, um, they will, any new registrants on that 15th day and beyond, uh, do not get uh, included in any of the communications or are not included on the list of the registrants that are on here. And that's just how it's defined in the bill uh, and how we had, why we had to build it that way. Now I'm going to take, uh, show you a different one. And you will see that these are all marked as pending yesterday. But if I didn't spray today and I'm planning on doing it tomorrow, I can select them again and mark them as pending again. And this will send a new notification out. So that's where the system resets overnight. It'll, it'll reset to the available spray if you're within the window and my phone's blowing up right now because I'm a registrant on this one. Um, so it's, uh, you can do this every day that you plan on spraying the next day. What you can't do is update any, there we go, which one is the one I was looking at earlier? No, well, I've lost it. Anything that is marked as complete, you can't update again because it's basically been a completed spray. So if you have some units that are complete and some that are available to spray, when you mark that pending and select them all, it'll only notify on those units that are there. Now, one of the things that um, 
is part of the um, process is we understand that at the end of uh, that 90 days and it has expired, the system will look like this. So your start date was here, your end date was there, and the application window has expired. You can extend for another 90 days. And that is done after it expires, you go to the top and you notify for a new 90 day application window. So you can start this and it is only a seven day waiting period. So if I were just to submit this today, I'd only have to wait seven days and then the new 90 day window occurs. This also restarts the search for any registrants that are within a mile. So it will update that registration list and also notify registrants immediately. There's not that 14 day delay. So this seven day waiting period and this, this uh, apply for a new nine, nine day window can actually occur seven days before the end of the original 90 days. So you're, if you're at eight, day 87 or excuse me, 83, and you know you want to extend it another 90 days, you can go in here, extend it for another 90 days, and it will actually keep this open for a continuous 180 days. And it does bring those new registrants in, and it does communicate to them immediately. So let me go back to the presentation. The new notification statuses are unique to this process. And that is once you've submitted a notification, it is in proposed status, meaning it's been submitted, but it's not within that 90 day window. When it's within that 90 day window, it's shown as available to spray. So that means anytime within that 90 day window, they can spray. When a notifier plans on spraying the next day, they mark it as pending, and that's the status it's in for that 24 hours. And then complete means the spray was completed. Incomplete means the spray was started, not completed, but plans on being sprayed again. And then after that 90 day window has expired, the notification is expired. Also part of the Senate Bill 1602 was uh, us making the e-notification system mobile friendly. Now we didn't develop an app. That's a, a lot of work and, and a lot more money than, than was given to us, but we did make it mobile friendly. It's mobile responsive. So today, if you look at it, it, it doesn't match. It doesn't map well. Uh, it's kind of hard to click on things. When you click on it, it doesn't necessarily work. Um, so we have developed a mobile friendly design. So what you'll see is that across the top, there's that activities and, and the 90 day window and the mapping, and it looks really nice. And this was actually off of my phone. There's a home screen now where you click on that and go to the home page. Uh, the mapping part of it maps really nice. It's easy to draw with your fingers and zoom in like a normal phone. And this also applies to regular notifications. So we've done the entire e-notification system and made it mobile responsive, meaning on a phone or a, or a tablet, this is gonna look really nice. It's gonna map really well and work really well. Also, the text messages that come out of the system to the registrants look like this. Now this is has a bunch of extra text in there because it's under our system account and a trial account for the texting process. But you'll see that it states who the notifier is, what uh, notification it is, which registration that it is, and it has a link to that notification from your phone. Here is also the email the registrants receives. Same thing, tells you who's who notified that they're pending tomorrow, 
within which uh, registration it is, which units are near your registration, and a link to that notification. So our next steps in all of this is kind of complete the development. So development is actually pretty much 99% done. Um, we're in the process of testing and providing feedback and fine tuning and looking for errors. Not everything under mobile response will be complete. Not all of the features that we um, were hoping to deliver by December 1st will be there. So there will be a second phase of this that will launch uh, in 20, early 2022. Um, and that is more just the mobile response and some nice to have features that will make uh, using this easier. It also has some features that ODF um, kind of requires for managing and monitoring things. So the important dates are December 1st, registrants can get into the system and start registering. And then December 15th is when new notifications for 2022, 2022 uh, can be submitted using this new process. Um, so that's, uh, those are the two key dates. Look for that. We will be communicating that more often as we get closer to those dates. But um, those are the two key dates, December 1st for registrants, December 15th for 2022 notifications. Now, uh, that's all I had. Any questions? Yeah, we, we have a couple in the chat, Joe, and I'll, I can kind of facilitate those for you. Sure, yeah. So the first one is, if, um, if all your units are numbered in sequence, will they have a unit name assigned to them to know which unit is which? Yes, it comes in as unit one, unit two, unit three, unit four. Those can be edited to better match any type of a uh, written plan that you may be submitting. So if you have, you know, the Baker unit and the Charlie unit and the Lima unit, whatever, you can change those names in there to so it matches uh, whatever documentation you submit. Great, thank you. What's the what is the earliest time you can notify for the next day spraying in the AM? So what time in the morning? What's the earliest you could notify for spraying the next day? Uh, any time after twelve oh one a.m. until 11.59 p.m. or actually 6, 7 p.m. rather. All right. Um, let's see here. Next question. What happens when you finish part of a unit but it's not completed and you plan to spray the next days in that you finish it? Uh, so if I'm understanding that correctly, You've partially sprayed it, um, so it will be incomplete, and you're planning on spraying it the next day. Um, you will need to mark it as incomplete and then mark it as pending. And you have to do those two steps. On the ODF side of things, we can, we can see each step that it has occurred, each status that has occurred on uh, each unit. So it's important that you would document it as incomplete and then document it as pending the next day. Okay, what happens if you're on a spray project and out of service and don't get back into service till after 7 p.m.? Um, I don't know, Josh, you wanna take this one? This one's that, yeah. that so, legal technical thing. Yep, so uh, Senate Bill 1602 says that any notices um, for pending spray have to be submitted by 7 p.m. So basically in state law, now um, you submit that um, pending status in the system um, to be able to spray the next day. So that's a, that's a legal requirement. So, so in the, the flip side to that is if there's something <clears throat> wrong with the system, like ferns goes down, often, uh, I won't say often, it has occurred a couple times this year where the state data center has gone down due to uh, hacking activities or other things that have happened. And so a lot of our systems statewide go down. Um, if that occurs, that's something very different than not being able to get in, in contact uh, or in cell range to market by 7 p.m. 
so if something were to occur with the system, then there's there are things on our side that we take into consideration. Uh, let's see here, looking at the next set. Um, in the late spring, early summer, there are times that you're actively spraying after 7 p.m. Does that go on next day's completions? Um, we should be clear here, there's, there's a difference between um, the, the pending requirement at 7 p.m. and the reporting requirement for a completed or incompleted unit. So the, the pending um, update is required prior to 7 p.m. to be able to spray the next day. The completion requirement and incompletion requirement timing is based on when you complete the unit or the end of the day that you notified for it. So if you have a unit that was completed, you have 24 hours after it's completed to report that status. So if it was at 7.30 p.m., you have till 7.30 p.m. the next day to report that status as completed. If it's incomplete, you have till the end of the day um, to mark that status on the following day. So just, just to clearly separate those two. Uh, next question is, does this also apply to aerial fertilization? Uh, Senate Bill 1602 specifically excluded fertilization from these requirements. Right. Here, a uh, reminder in the chat for ODNF SAF continuing education credits, please enter that into the chat. Uh, next question, if one unit has multiple polygons, do you need to name each polygon different or can you combine? No, the system, uh, that's, yeah, that's what I tried, uh, what uh, I was explaining in the beginning was each polygon will be broken out by the system. So each polygon will be its own individual unit requiring an individual name, requiring its own activities and its own chemicals. All right, any, any other questions before we uh, move to the next topic? Uh, if a qualifying registrant registers during the 15 day waiting period of your notification, does that restart or extend the waiting period? Uh, so no, it doesn't. And um, just to clarify, there is a 15 day waiting period and a 30 day waiting period. Um, where a registrant comes in is in that, and then there's a 14 day delay between when it's submitted and when the registrants receive that notification. That 14 days is when new registrants come in and are, are included in the process. Um, and they can come in at any point up to that 14th day and then the system emails and doesn't look for anything new. It doesn't restart anything and doesn't do anything. So if if in that 14 days, originally, there were no registrants, and then at that 14th day, the system looks and there is a registrant there, it's still a 15 day waiting period. It doesn't extend it to 30 days. All right, thanks, Joe. Um, one more question. Are we only required to update the status if there are registrants within a mile? And that's an, you have to do it regardless of registrants or not. All right. Yep. And here you just fine. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm Jennifer Ward. I'm a stewardship forester out of the Coos Bay office and a member of the Senate Bill 1602 project team. And I'm going to talk about water uses qualifying for a spray buffer under 1602. A person may not directly apply pesticide by helicopter to forest land within 300 feet from a water intake for water use qualifying for a spray buffer within the same six level hydrologic unit. Water uses qualifying for a spray buffer are for watering not more than one half acre of lawn or non-commercial garden used by one or more dwelling units for domestic animal consumption, ancillary to residential or related use of a property, used by one or more dwelling units for household purposes or human consumption, for livestock watering, or supplied for community purposes through a municipal water system, a system operated by a federally recognized Indian tribe, 
or a system operated by a private corporation. The 300 foot buffer only applies to surface water intakes that fall with one in, within one of these descriptions, which are either mapped within ODF system for data received by Oregon Water Resources Department or are provided by an approved registrant. Water intakes will only be approved through the registrant process if they fall within one of these uses. The requirement to buffer these water intakes cannot be waived by the landowner. Senate Bill 1602 directed ODF to work with Oregon Water Resources Department to record any points of diversion that qualify for a spray buffer and are mapped with sufficient precision. Once recorded, these points are required to be protected with a 300 foot spray buffer when pesticides are applied to forest land by helicopter. Nothing changes about the type D stream classification and protection within the FPA under the current rules. 300 foot buffers are in addition to our current rules and are also measured in horizontal distance. Only surface water intakes require the 300 foot buffer. There may be some nuances as to exactly what those intakes look like in the field, and I'll elaborate on that in a minute. But the bottom line is, if they are mapped within our system as a surface water right, and they meet one of the qualifying uses, then they receive protection. Apply the current rules and the new Senate Bill 1602 requirements to register domestic surface water points of diversion in streams, and apply Senate Bill 1602 requirements to surface water intakes qualifying for a spray buffer mapped in ODF system. This will include domestic points of diversion, which are in a stream and receive type D classification. I'll show an example of this on the next slide. ODF has already been using points of diversion to determine type D stream classification. Those points are registered domestic points of diversion that came from OWRD data. Some of those points did not use to require protection, for example, springs with no stream channel. If you've ever had to look for one of those intakes, you're probably already aware that the accuracy isn't always perfect. Sometimes they're mapped on the hillside and they're actually in a stream and vice versa. Another thing to keep in mind is registered water right holders have the right to move their intake up to 500 feet without notifying OWRD. The frequency of this is not well known as there's no reporting requirements when an intake is moved. The new points are coming from water intake data from OWRD's database that represent registered water uses that qualify for a spray buffer. So not necessarily for domestic use like the points we use right now. Landowners and operators will be responsible for locating these water intakes. The Senate Bill 1602 team reviewed over 192,000 OWRD records, and of those were able to qualify 27,496 as being mapped with sufficient precision to implement the bill requirements. The new data will be combined with the old data <clears throat> and the data set will be available on ODF's website for landowners and operators to download soon. Registrants will provide ODF with the GPS coordinates of their water intake. These are typically not field verified. Points provided by registrants could be more accurate than the data provided by OWRD or could be less accurate depending on the registrant's ability to obtain accurate GPS coordinates. These points may or may not be a registered water right. Certain water uses are exempt from needing to be registered by OWRD, such as seeps or springs that originate on a person's property. As soon as water, the water intake registration is approved, it becomes a protected resource. In the event that there's a helicopter pesticide application notified and the registration with of the notification being submitted, the parties on the notification will receive that registration contact information in an automated email on the 14th day after the notification was submitted. If a registration is approved after 14 days, you will be notified by your stewardship forester that there's a new qualified water intake that may affect your operation area. This would only occur if there were an intake that wasn't already in the system, the unit affected had not been reported as complete, and the 300 foot buffer may impact the application area. Registrant intakes that qualify for a spray buffer will also be available for download on ODF's website. This layer will change over time as new registrants are approved or cancel their res res registrations. So for the most up-to-date information, be sure to download the layer before each project. Mapping and inventorying accurate intake data will be an ongoing effort 
for OWRD, and ODF will periodically review and import new data from OWRD as it becomes available. So here's an example of what these new stream buffers look like on the ground. The green circles are all 300 foot spray buffers applied to water uses qualifying for a spray buffer. The three outside the stream are all surface water springs. The blue hatched areas are all stream buffers that meet Senate Bill 1602 requirements. As you can see here, there are a couple of uh, points of diversion in the stream, which would require a 75 foot spray buffer if there were summer surface flow above the intake. However, they also require that 300 foot buffer. And that's required regardless of the stream classification. So pay attention to water intakes outside of the unit that may be within 300 feet. Since the accuracy of the water intake may be off, it'd probably be a good idea to look even a little further out than 300 feet, just to make sure that all points are protected as required. This sh slide shows why it's important to look outside the unit further than 300 feet. Actual water intake locations are the two small patches of trees with red circles around them. One is just over 300 feet away, and the other one is 250 feet away from their actual location. The actual intake itself is what receives the protection, not the point on the map. The 300 foot buffer is measured in horizontal distance from the intake structure itself. This particular situation is interesting because there's um, points of diversion here are listed as surface water spring. However, they're buried about 20 feet below the surface. So even though the intakes are not on the surface, they're both registered as domestic surface water rights. Therefore, protection is required. I don't mention this scenario to cause confusion because I don't think that this is super frequent, but um, it, it was a real scenario that came up earlier this summer. So it might be more common than we think it is. So since the water right is registered as a surface water domestic, even though it's buried below the surface, it's required to be protected with a 300 foot spray buffer. Water intakes qualifying for a spray buffer must be within the same six level hydrologic unit to receive the 300 foot buffer. Six level hydrologic units or six level watersheds as they're commonly referred to are also known as HUC 12 watersheds because they're assigned a 12 digit hydrologic unit code. These are sub watersheds predefined by the Federal Geographic Data Commission, which are delineated using nationally consistent guidelines and are used as an interagency standard for watershed management. A 12 digit hydrologic unit code, or called a HUC, is usually between 10,000 and 40,000 acres in size, which is a bit smaller or bigger than a township, whereas a 10 digit hydrologic unit, the next level up, is comparable to the size of a county, unless you're in Eastern Oregon. Six level watersheds are fairly large, so most likely if there's an intake that qualifies for a spray buffer within 300 feet of a unit receiving a pesticide application by helicopter, the unit and the intake are probably going to be in the same six level watershed, but there's always a chance that they're not. Six level watershed boundaries will be available soon on our website for landowners and operators to be able to download. Let's review the buffer requirements. The only apply to surface water intakes, the intake must be for a use that qualifies for a spray buffer. They're measured in horizontal distance from the intake structure itself. The surface water intake must be reported in our system. The new buffer requirement does not add additional type D classification to streams. They only apply to application of pesticides by helicopter on forest land. The buffer is required as soon as a registration is approved. The intake must be within the same six level watershed as the unit receiving the application and written plans are not required for Senate Bill 1602 300 foot buffers. And I'll take any questions on that now. So I think Jennifer, I'll go back and attempt to address the previous question from the previous section on a point of diversion versus a point of use. And after having reviewed that question um, while we were going through the presentation here, the, uh, um, the, the question relating to that, the reason we require that description of the end use is it's actually um, we're, we need to do that um, for exempt water uses that are registered so we can identify what that end use is for and um, ensure it meets the specifications of Senate Bill 1602. So that, that was the specific requirement noted there.
And I don't see any other uh, questions in the chat at the moment. Okay, I'll, I'll go on then. All right, so um, talk about the Senate Bill 1602 predetermined fines. So Senate Bill 1602 was written with a predetermined fine schedule for failure to report timely notices. The way the bill was written did not include any flexibility for districts to determine whether a civil, civil penalty should be issued or not. Many of the current FPA rules require non-immediately repairable damage as a prerequisite to issuing a civil penalty. Senate Bill 1602 does not require damage prior to the issuance of a civil penalty for failing to report timely notices. Failure to mark units pending by 7 p.m. the day prior to applying pesticides by helicopter, or failing to report the unit as incomplete 24 hours after the end of the date specified for the application, or failing to mark the units as complete no more than 24 hours after the completion of the application will result in a civil penalty being issued by the, to the landowner. The issuance of civil penalties will be separated by two spray seasons within each calendar year. The first spray season starts on January 1st and ends on June 30th. And the second spray season starts on July 1st and ends on December 31st. For the first day during a spray season on which one or more failures occur, a warning will be issued. For the second day, a $1,000 fine, $1, fine will be issued. And for the third day and each day after that, a $5,000 fine will be issued. We understand technical issues may occur. However, they should be rare and we encourage you to reach out to your stewardship forester or local ODF office as soon as you run into a problem or as soon as you're able to find enough service to do so. If you're unable to reach anyone and there's no option for you to change the status of units before the required deadline, please document the reason that you couldn't and then also your attempt to contact someone for help in the box that pops up after you try to report your accomplishments without first making the unit pending by 7 p.m. the previous day. Section 15 of Senate Bill 1602 talks about the interference with an application of pesticide by helicopter. A person that intentionally interferes with a pesticide application by helicopter to forest land commits an unclassified violation punishable by a fine of $1,000 if it's their first violation of this type and a fine of $5,000 if they have had a previous interference violation within the past five years. Interference will be considered intentional if it's performed by a nearby recipient or registrant who has sent, been sent information about an upcoming helicopter pesticide application. The memorializing of pesticide application activities through photography, videotaping, audio taping, or other creation of electronic record from a place that the person has the, right, the lawful right to be present is not considered interference. ODF does not have the authority to administer these types of violations. Interference violations will be handled by a law enforcement officer, so either Oregon State Police or County Sheriff, who will be responsible for the citing at the individual interfering with the operation, and that violation would go through the circuit court judge. These two sections are the only predetermined fines within the bill. All other violations of the bill requirements would be handled through the typical civil penalties process. Any questions on that? All right. Uh, hey, everyone. It's uh, Brooke Burgess again. So here's just a quick little rundown of who to contact for questions um, regarding Senate Bill 1602 and these new processes that we've shared with you today. Um, so for uh, questions about notifying um, registration assistance, request to change operator, Senate Bill rule administration, questions about helicopter pesticide applications, complaints and enforcement, you would contact your local stewardship forester. And um, this link here would take you to the ODF external website where you could click on your area to find out who that is. And then for how to register approvals or registrations that might need more information, you would contact um, me and here's my email or the registration email address, um, which I will be monitoring, and my cell phone number and my uh, office number. Great. 
Great. All thank right. you, Brooke. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you. Uh, there's one uh, one question in the chat. Um, I think I can answer that. Um, it says you mentioned Ferns is going mobile. On what platform and method? It's uh, just the online mobile friendly version. So it's it's mobile responsive. It's not an app. So it'll work in a, a web browser on a mobile device. Thank you, Joe. What happens with the penalty money that ODF collects? That is returned to the general fund. ODF does not keep uh, the money from the penalties that it collects. And one last reminder from Paul to uh, submit your ODA um, information for credits. There's one more question there, Josh, I don't think we got to. Um, my old well is a shallow, more of a spring diverted into a cistern, which is partly above the ground. Two falls in a row, I had symptoms I felt were due to forestry pesticide poisoning, and I invested in a deeper well. I still use the old well to irrigate. Does it qualify for a buffer? And um, so wells are not covered under Senate Bill 1602, only surface water intakes. That's correct. So it, would, it wouldn't qualify if it's, if it's a well. Let's see, any other question? Does the 90 day activity window begin after the waiting period ends? And yes, it does. So it's, if it's a 15 day waiting period, it, it begins at that point. Um, that's the earliest it can begin. Um, it's really as defined when the notifier submits the notification. They can notify on January 1st and not have the 90 day window begin until May. So um, it's, it just defines it within the, within the notification. And Josh, there's a question there. Um, uh, well, it, I guess it's more of a statement um, saying that they're concerned that livestock point of use could be abused or shifted by the registrant. Well, thank, thanks for um, raising that. And Brooke, yeah, and so for this process, what we're really subject to are the processes that are laid out in 1602. So all the identified uses. Um, so if it's, if it's a registered, um, Point that has a permit or certificate through Oregon Water Resources Department, there will be documentation on that. If it's an exempt use, it'll be based on what they submit um, for information to us, and um, you know we'll review that. Um, if it goes beyond that scope, it may become a uh, an issue of you know who has the right to what water and the legitimate use would be more of an Oregon Water Resources Department question. Is the 300 foot buffer for houses and schools applied from the structure or the parcel boundary? You wanna answer that Jennifer or do you want? Yeah, I'll do that. Um, so for, the, for homes, it's from the structure itself. For schools, it's for the campus boundary. All right, and I don't see any more questions popping into the chat. Uh, so there's a question in the chat, I might, might need you to clarify it. it says, what are your thoughts on non-registered points of diversion? Um, so maybe I'll just state clearly there's um, the, the different types of 
ways that information can enter the system again, back to Jennifer's presentation. So um, we have the Oregon Water Resources data, which um, would be some sort of permit or certificate um, that already exists um, that we pulled in that meets the water use is qualifying for a spray buffer. Uh, a registrant um, can also register a surface water intake, which may be one of those points, or it could be another point um, that we had determined wasn't accurate enough, but they have collected the GPS point and still want to submit that. that. That is another piece of the data that could be brought into the system when they decide to register a surface water intake. And then the other one is it does allow for exempt uses. So that would need to meet the definitions um, used by Oregon Water Resources Department of an exempt use, also meeting the uses with qualifying for a spray buffer to be submitted via that mechanism. So those are, those are the, the different ways that those can come into the system for protection and for receiving communications, uh, the registrant has to take action and submit those to receive communications. Uh, and one other question coming in, is there an ability to submit a plan for alternate practice for aerial spray buffers? In other words, if a rancher does not want a 300 foot buffer on an intake. The, the, the protection requirements, we're not able to waive those through any mechanism. Uh, and there's one more question around the water intake seeking clarification. Uh, intakes that are not on their property and not registered with Oregon Water Resources. Uh, again, we'd have to go through that process of if it was an exempt use and met the use water use qualifying for a spray buffer. Um, I, I think those are pretty limited if they exist at all. So that um, there would be a review step there. All right, going once, twice. Uh, I'd like to say thank you to everyone who took the time to engage in today's training. Um, that concludes the Senate Bill 1602 helicopter pesticide training. Thank you.